Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening or afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, this is a health and safety training hosted by two Seattle-based street medics. My name is Alice Howie, and I am a street medic. I'm currently a nursing student, and I'm always a caregiver. Um, so a couple things before we go any further. We are currently recording this. Um, this will be shared potentially um, to other folks who request it, and then also through 350 Seattle and potentially 350 National. Um, so you're welcome to turn off your screens. If the recording gets shared, it will be, I believe, just Kara and myself, but we do like to make sure everyone knows that this is currently being recorded. Um, another thing that I definitely want to acknowledge is that while I'm in what is called Seattle right now, this is the traditional land of the Duwamish and Coast Salish people. The Duwamish tribe does not yet have federal recognition. Um, and a way to support them is through an organization or a system called Real Rent Duwamish and that does monthly reoccurring payments for, to the tribe um, to support their work and their people of now. Um, so, we also recognize that folks are coming from all over the country um, and encourage you to take a look at um, whose land you live on now and ways to support those folks. Um, so, Kara, would you like to introduce yourself? We'll continue on. Hi, everybody. My name is Kara, and I use they, them pronouns. Um, I am also a street medic and have been doing protests and organizing and street work uh, for a while now, um, having been a street medic the last few years. Um, and street medics, just so just to clarify some terminology, are a group of people who've taken a 20-hour training, um, or should be if they're marking themselves as street medics. So we have had a specific set of training in basic first aid and chemical weapons defense in a consent-based model of care. Um, so that is kind of where we're coming from in this and some of the experience that we're bringing to this work. Um, yeah, and like Alice, I live in unceded Duwamish territory in what is called Seattle. Um, and really excited to be sharing this with so many people across the country. We're really excited to be getting this all out for you today. Um, so with that, I'm just going to give a quick overview of kind of the flow of the training and what we're going to talk about. Um, the main goal of this training is how to be safe when you're out in the streets. Uh, we will include a bit of information for folks who are not able to go out either because of disabilities or obligations, or especially now that we are living in a pandemic. Um, we will kind of talk about some ways that folks can help from home, but we're going to have a lot of information about how to safely show up in the streets. Uh, with your comrades to try to do all kinds of different social change that is much needed in this world today um, and has been needed for a long time. And so, yeah, like Alice had mentioned, we are going to have this recording available for folks to watch. Um, so, you know, feel free to turn off your video if you are not interested, though I think we are having it set to speaker view so it won't include the participants. Um, but just for your own personal safety, that's something you can do. Um, so, yeah, with that, I think Alice is going to lead us in a little beginning moment. All right. So, um, we are all coming from different parts of our day, different parts of the country. Um, and I want to take just a minute or two to take a couple breaths. Um, come into this next, a little less than two hours. Um, so, in some way, put your body on the ground. I have the soles of my feet on the ground and I'm sitting in a chair. If you're comfortable, um, close your eyes and we're just gonna take some breaths together. I will um, let us do that and I'll bring you all back in in about a minute or so. So, together, let's breathe in. And breathe out. And just come into come into this moment. Come into caring for yourself for a little bit. Um, and I will bring you back in another minute.
Okay. So I hope everyone's feeling a little bit more gathered, a little bit more present. Um, so let's begin. Um, we are bringing this training to you in the context of a lot of different big things. Um, this summer has seen a huge response to the killing of George Floyd by Derek Chauvin in Minneapolis and has seen a mass uprising in support of the Black Lives Matter movement, in support of defunding police. Um, and so we want to definitely uphold that. That is a big reason we're holding this training now. Um, we're also in the midst of a climate crisis. A lot of us are experiencing climate change in the form of hurricanes, flooding, fires along the West Coast, and the smoke that comes with them. Um, so that is definitely something that is occupying a lot of my lived experience at the moment, and I imagine the same for some of you. Um, this is also a time where we're seeing repression from state governments, local governments, national governments. It's an election season. And then we're in a respiratory pandemic. Um, so there's a lot going on. There's a lot of reasons to show up in the streets at protests, um, a lot of reasons to participate in movement work. Um, and our goal is that this training will both support you in being healthy and safe while you're at an action, at a march, at a demonstration, but also um, that this is, can help provide a framework for providing care to yourself and others in your life. Um, I think this is a really important time to develop our care webs um, and to come into some interdependence and more support for each other. Um, so our goal is that this is going to help you out both to show up in movement space, to support folks, um, and then to care for yourself and others even when you're not out at actions. Um, so. I want to take a little time. This It's weird to be on a Zoom call. We are so fortunate that we can all come together. Um, but I do want to take a moment to introduce ourselves. Um, so we're going to use the chat box for this since there's a large number of us. Um, and I have a couple questions that I want everyone to answer. So the first one is going to be, what's your name? Um, what's your name? What pronouns do you use? The second question is, where are you coming from? Um, and I encourage you to use different names for the land that you're on. Um, the, so that's going to be the second one. And then the third one is, what do you want to grow and develop in terms of your participation in movement work? Um, so my name is Alice. I use she and her pronouns. I am coming from what is known as Seattle. Um, and I want to get better at using writing to process my experiences and then to develop my ideas. So take a couple minutes, think about what your answers are, what your name and your pronouns are, where you're coming from, and what you want to grow and develop. And type that into the chat box. It's just going to be a popcorn. So you may want to scroll around and read other folks. Um, and I'm going to give us a couple minutes. So once the results really trickle down, um, we'll come all back together. But for the moment, Throw your stuff up into the chat and we'll see a little bit about each other. All right. All right. Feel free to add more um, if things come up. Thank you all for sharing. I see a lot about connection, about showing up in solidarity, about keeping yourself safe and healthy, about learning how to use more tech options, also, how I, having more spontaneous action. Um, thank you all for sharing, and thanks for being here. Um, so, Kara's going to introduce us to a little bit of the vocabulary that we're talking about. We recognize that folks are here with a variety of different levels of experiencing um, violence from police, with different experiences protesting, um, and that we also all have really different risk analyses right now. Um, so I'm going to hand this off to Kara and we'll get going. Thanks. Cool. Yeah. Um, a lot of times in the work of activism, it can, uh, it can be really easy to slip into some jargon and using some terms and abbreviations and things that some people might not understand. 
Um, and in my experience with organizing, um, I've heard a lot of people say that they have felt not welcome in certain spaces because people are kind of talking about things they don't understand. Um, so I just wanted to go through a quick set of just a few things that we want to define. And I do want to mention, um, I am kind of weirdly good at multitasking. So I am looking at the chat box really frequently. So if you at any moment have a question about something that was said, please feel free to drop it in the chat. If it doesn't get dressed immediately, get addressed <laughs> immediately, it will address it um, very soon because we want to make sure that everyone feels that this is a very safe and open environment for questions. Um, so definitely do that. And at any time, if you have questions in general about something we're talking about, if you drop that into the chat box. Um, the last time we did this, we actually had a lot of people answering each other, because uh, I think it's really important to acknowledge that it's not just Alice and I here that have a lot of information and knowledge, it's actually all of you as well. Um, and some of you actually know even more than you think you know. Once you start hearing things, you may have answers. Um, so with that, um, one of the things I wanna mention is that, as I had mentioned as street medics, we operate under consent-based practices. So it's really important to define consent um, and especially when you're in the streets, using consent as something that you are basically always asking for. You're always asking people, can I help you with this? Is it all right if I approach you? Is it all right if I put my hand on your shoulder? Can I hold your arm to help pull you away from this tear gas? You really want to do consent and understand the meaning of it as a consistent and ongoing practice. Um, just because you've been given consent once for something doesn't mean you will always have consent for that. Um, so defining consent as an ongoing practice is really important in this work. Um, and we will also mention scope of practice. So scope of practice is about knowing what you are trained to do and only doing those things. Um, so, you know, if you're not a surgeon, you wouldn't offer to give someone surgery. That's outside of your scope of practice. So the same thing applies on the streets. If you don't know how to do an eye flush, it is best to not offer to do one. It's better to help find someone who knows how to do it. And we're gonna talk a bit about eye flushes um, and send, we can send a video as well in the chat so that people can watch it. It's really good to practice at home. Um, and we are gonna mention the term affinity group. That is a group of people who are working together at a protest um, that have affinity, that have agreed to certain sets of principles and ideas and actions before showing up. Um, or you could even arrange it on the fly. It's just a little harder. So when we say affinity group, that's what we're talking about. Um, and then there are different sort of like types of protests that can happen. Um, I kind of have these in different I'll just say them in the word I have them. okay so there's a march um, a march people understand is something where you're actively like walking somewhere um, and often it could be coupled with a rally a rally is when you're just standing somewhere holding signs having speakers rallying for some kind of cause it's just kind of um, stationary um, a demonstration is a word that gets used a lot and that can be kind of anything that is demonstrating, um, I would say a lot of what's been happening around the country has been more of the demonstration variety where it could be stationary, but might be a little more active where people are blocking certain things. Um, and then you get into civil disobedience and direct action. Um, and that's something like at 350 Seattle, we're very interested in doing civil disobedience and direct action to stop fossil fuel infrastructure and fossil fuel funders. So those are things, civil disobedience is where you are intentionally breaking a law to bring the message around an unjust cause. So if you say, I refuse to leave this bank lobby until you stop funding fossil fuels, you know that trespassing is a crime and you agree that you're going to stay there to make your point. Um, and direct action is in even more specific, actually stopping the thing that is happening. Um, so an example of that would be last November when the Mosquito Fleet and Portland Rising Tide came together 
to block a ship from India bringing pipes from the Trans Mountain Pipeline. And people tied themselves to the pier and got in kayaks and blocked the ship from dropping off their load. That is a direct action. Um, so some of these words might come up um, and it's when you're hearing about something that's gonna happen, these may help you decide what type of event it is, which can help you decide how best to prepare for it. Um, and I wanted to say, I noticed the question in the chat, how can the dominating society members align in person with the tribal issues needing support? That's a really good question. And it's kind of outside the scope of this training, but I will say the best way to align with any tribal members needing support is to ask them directly what they need. It's really important to ask a community what they need rather than trying to come up with something you think that they would need. Um, so that would be like building relationships with those people and that would be really helpful. Um, and that actually kind of leads into the building relationships piece will kind of bring us centered back into this training because um, we're gonna start talking about how to prepare to go to an action. And the first thing we're gonna talk about is pretty much the most important thing that you need to bring, and that is your buddy. So Shimona, if you could do the first slide, um, we have Shimona doing slides for us, our awesome tech person. And so we're gonna see the screen sharing moment. And uh, yeah, this will be the first thing we talk about. So the most important thing that you will bring to any protest is your buddy. Um, you do not wanna go alone to a protest. Um, it can be dangerous. You can, it's with a buddy, there's so many ways that it's a lot safer. You have people who are around you that can be looking forward while you're looking backwards. Um, you have somebody to help you if you start to get anxious or nervous, or if they start to get anxious or nervous. Um, maybe they brought snacks and you forgot snacks, and so they can help you with that. Um, plus it's just a lot more fun and it is a good way to really build affinity and build relationships with people um, and to really build the movement. Um, the more buddies you can bring who maybe haven't ever been to a protest before or thought about going but were scared to go alone, the more that we can really start to build that movement so we show up in the streets en masse and can really make a lot of changes. Um, so in thinking about a buddy, the, some street medics have developed this really helpful acronym. Um, it's important to think about when choosing your buddy. You may think of your best friend in the whole world, who's your best friend and you love them so much, but maybe your best friend is a little flaky or maybe your best friend is somebody who just kind of disappears suddenly when you're out at an event um, and you don't really know where they went. You need to think about if that is the buddy that you want to bring with you to a high intensity protest situation. Um, so this is a protocol called Pearly, and it is a tool to talk to your buddy to see if before you go out, you feel like you're well matched to go out together. Um, so the first thing, the P is for physical vulnerabilities. And this is basically to decide um, to talk amongst you and your potential buddy about any physical vulnerabilities you may have. Um, if somebody isn't able to walk as fast or as long or has an injury, or if your friend is in a wheelchair and the march is going to be all uphill, decide how that might work for you and what ways you could either participate, participate partially, or participate in different ways. Um, so it's really important to acknowledge those things. And it can even really include some things um, just about, you know, I don't like loud noises, or I have allergies, and I need to make sure I bring my inhaler. Um, it can also be important in this P section to talk about your um, visible identities that may make you a greater target for police. Um, and we definitely know that people of color, especially black people in this country are targeted by police a lot more. So it's important to talk about 
that with your buddy and to say, is this something that we should be concerned about and how are we going to address it? Um, it's also a good place to talk about some of that consent. Like if it starts to get a little chaotic and we need to run, is it okay if we hold hands to try to get through the crowd faster? Um, can we like grab each other's bags if somebody's going to fall? It's good to talk about some of that beforehand so you don't accidentally trigger somebody or cross a line that they might feel uncomfortable with. Um, the E is for emotional vulnerabilities. And these are things where you would talk about how you're feeling. It could start with how are you feeling about this action today? Um, how are you feeling in general? Did you just have a really big fight with your partner? Did you just have a really big test? Is there something that has happened that you may feel stressed out more than usual? Um, and also, how do you handle emotional situations? Like, are there some situations where you know that you'll get really stressed out if X, Y, or Z happens? If you've been around like flashbangs before and you know that they stress you out a lot, um, it's good to mention that to your buddy. And it would be really important to make sure that that happens, um, that discussion before you're in the situation. Um, so then the A is for arrestability. And this is really important to talk about because you don't always know when you're out in the streets, the police are entirely unpredictable. Um, and even if you're in the green zone or what you think is the not arrestable zone, um, the police can make that an arrestable zone very quickly. And so it's important to talk with your buddy beforehand about arrestability. If you are a hard stop, not arrestable, you have things to take care of, you have children or pets or school or anything, that's important for your buddy to know so that you all both can be very attentive to things as they're developing and try to stay really as far as possible away from any of the action that might cause a problem. Um, and you should always defer to the least arrestable buddy's needs. So if you're really like, I'm down to get in the mix, like I want to be at the front line, like I don't care, I go to jail for this, but you're talking to a buddy who does not want to do that, it's okay to maybe find a different buddy. Try to find a frontline buddy and your other friend can try to find a green zone buddy. And that way you can sort of make sure that no one is feeling forced at the last minute to put themselves in a situation that they're not prepared for. Um, and this is especially important for people to think about with different legal concerns like your immigration status, um, if you're under 18, if you have any prior convictions or outstanding warrants any kind of different things that might make your arrest level more important um, to consider in that moment. Uh, the R stands for roles. So this is kind of about your comfort level in the action and what role you have in it. If you are an organizer, uh, and I know I see some of the folks on here who I know, I know you are organizers. So if you're at an action, you're all over the place looking at a million different things at once. You got a lot going on. You're not going to be able to really like pay attention as much to a friend who is maybe new and wants to know what's going on. What's happening now? What do I do next? Um, it might be a little harder to do that when you're also trying to figure out like, are these things in place? Is this thing happening as it is? What's this new thing happening over here? Um, and for me as a street medic, if I show up as a street medic, that means that I don't, I'm there to medic. And so I can't necessarily hold a banner. People all the time see me standing there with my hands free and they're like, oh, will you hold this banner? And I say, no, I'm sorry. I'm a street medic because if somebody gets hurt or if chemical weapons are deployed, I'm dropping that banner immediately and leaving. And I don't have time to decide like, oh, can somebody else hold this banner? How do I find you? You know? So to me, that is a role that I would not do is banner holding because I'm there to medic. So it's important to talk about those roles with your buddy and see where you are in relation to each other's roles. Um, and you can definitely have, like I've been a street medic and brought a buddy that's not a street medic. And that's great if that buddy's willing to help create a privacy circle or hold my bag and hand me bandages when I need them. 
There's all kinds of ways that you can work around your roles, but it's really important to discuss them. And also if you have any special skills. Um, if you're not a street medic, but you are CPR certified, it's just important for your buddy to know that and for you to decide at this moment before going out, would I be willing to use that skill if needed? Because you don't have to if you aren't able to in that moment. Um, and then another important thing in roles is what would it take for you to quit the action? Um, if you're there as a participant and that's your role, that's great. That's an excellent role. And then what would it take for you? What would be the level when you said, nope, I have to leave now? Would it be the police showing up? Would it be deployment of chemical weapons? Would it be I'm staying till the end, even if it ends up being an overnight and we're marching and we're camping out in the mayor's lawn? That's good to know in advance. Um, the L is for loose ends, and that is a really good just kind of catch-all for where you talk about, is there anything else we need to talk about? Are you expecting a call about a job interview that you'll need to walk away and take the call immediately? Um, are you waiting to, you know, go somewhere at a certain time, or do you have to be done by five because you have to go pick up a child from daycare. There's all kinds of different things that you can cover. This is just anything else that you feel is important for your buddy to know. Um, and then finally, a thing that was added later by some street medics, I believe in Boston, was the why. Um, and that is for yes or no. Because the most important thing is that consent. And if you've had this whole discussion with somebody who you think might be your buddy, for the action, but you think that maybe those are not aligned, then this is where you say, like, should we be buddies? Yes or no. And it's okay to say no. If you feel that some of the things don't match up and you don't think that y'all would be good buddies for that action, it is definitely okay to say no because you want to make sure that you feel as comfortable as possible, that your buddy feels as comfortable as possible, and that you know you're going into a really probably tense situation. Even the most perfect and beautiful, well-planned actions that happen and are great and there's no police interaction and people can pack up and go home at the end and it was awesome, they're still stressful. There's still a lot going on. So it's really important that you have a buddy and that you've talked about all these things to make sure that you are really feeling secure about what's going on. And so with that, I will say... I will answer this question about the meds. Somebody just asked if you will need to take meds if you're arrested. Um, that is actually something we are gonna talk about, but I will give a quick answer now is that you should have your meds on you and you have your prescription, but the police are not actually required to give them to you. And in fact, if you are taken to jail, and they don't, they're not going to give you your own meds. They'll take them away from you, but it helps for you to have the bottle so they can see what it is. But if they don't have that medication in the jail pharmacy, you will not be getting your medication. So it's very important for people who take meds to think about that. We are going to talk about that later. And there's going to be a training that talks about it a little more. So we're going to circle back around to that. Um, and with that, I will let Alice start talking about the next thing. Okay. Um, so let's go to the next slide. Um, and so right now we're in the context of how to get prepared to go out into the streets. Um, you've now chosen your buddy. You've both decided that you're ready to partner together. One of the things that maybe you've talked about specifically is the medications that you use. Um, that can be good information to share. Um, and then also really important information. Um, when you're finding someone to tell that you're going to an action or a march, so find someone who's not going to participate um, and let them know that you'll be there. Um, and then check in with them when you're done. Um, so important information to leave with that person would be your contact information, maybe emergency contacts, the medications that you're on, if you feel comfortable sharing that or if you think that that would be useful. Um, so you have both a buddy, but
but also um, someone that you've let know that you're going to go to this action and that you will check in and that they have assured you that they will be prepared to accept your check-in whenever it may come. Um, so I often have a friend let them know that I'm going to be out and they say, okay, cool. I'll be awake until you let me know you're home. Um, so you've got a couple people lined up now and things to consider in the context of protesting during this particular pandemic. Um, obviously we're wearing masks. Um, so bring extra masks, um, both for yourself and to hand out and share with others. If you're someone who's been sewing masks, this is an excellent opportunity to put some masks in a Ziploc bag or individually pack them and bring them out with you. Um, surgical masks are also an option. A lot of folks will write on their backpack. They'll put a little sign up that say, I have extra masks and hand sanitizer to hand out. Um, so that's a really nice way to build some community, to build some relationships with folks who are out with you. Um, bring hand sanitizer. That is a role that Kara and I have definitely played is distributing hand sanitizer. Um, and if you have extra, again, bring it to share. Um, there's been a lot of resource sharing this summer, um, which is a little bit in contrast to other times of protesting in action. Um, so think about, yeah, what you need, but maybe bring some extra to share with others. So one thing that I do want to highlight in the city of Seattle, we have testing that is available for folks who are insured and then free if you're uninsured. Um, and for people who have said that they are getting tested because of exposure at a protest, um, fewer than half of 1% of people have tested positive for COVID. So I think that's important to remember that even though we are gathering in large groups, um, there is a lower level of transmission. And now the important thing is to kind of figure out where that fits into your level of risk assessment. Um, so thinking about how much exposure you are willing to take on, how much exposure you are willing to take on and also for those in your household. Um, and so it may be that being in the streets does not make sense. Um, that is definitely a possibility. Um, so we have a couple suggestions on the left-hand side um, for ways to participate without putting yourself out at a higher risk of exposure to COVID-19. So cooking food for a friend um, and delivering it, maybe dropping it off at their door or dropping it off when they get home, um, that's going to be a really good option. Um, of course, donating to bail funds, street medic collectives, the NLG, which we'll talk about a little bit more, that is the National Lawyers Guild. Um, maybe you're donating to a mutual aid organization. There are a lot more of those than there were earlier this year. Um, sewing masks and sending them off with others that you know will be protesting or participating. Um, maybe you set up a, you make some food and you know that there's going to be a march and you know a little bit of the route. And so you set up a table. Um, along the route and you you're there to pass out water to pass out food maybe you're passing out packaged snacks um, or supplies that is a really nice way to participate um, and then providing emotional support for folks who go out um, as Kara said even at a really like beautifully organized and calm action it's often intense and somewhat stressful um, and Something that we'll talk about in aftercare is providing emotional support to yourself and others. And so a really important role to play is talking to folks who are participating in the streets um, and letting them know that you're ready to just hear about their experience and help them process that experience. Um, okay, another thing would be being that check-in person saying, okay, I'll be awake until whenever you get home, let me know. Um, and so you can be there for that. Um, providing or coordinating child care is going to be another option or elder care or special needs care. Um, supporting others in their care responsibilities. Um, okay, so in the context of COVID, right now there's a lot of smoke in the air as well. And so N95s are going to be the ideal or a, a better option for being outside to protect yourself from the particulates. Those are in fairly limited supply as well because of the pandemic. Um, so it's complex. 
Um, and there's a lot of things to consider. And we just kind of want to get you thinking about some of those ways to make sure that you stay more safe or as safe as can be. Okay. Daily medications. Um, we've touched on that. We suggest that you bring them with you and especially bring the prescription. Um, it is also, when you leave for a protest, you don't necessarily know how long you will be gone for. Um, so definitely have anything that you're going to take a couple hours later with you. Um, if you take something, if you use an albuterol inhaler, if you use an EpiPen, um, absolutely bring those with you so that you can access those if you need to. Um, it, it is definitely complicated when it comes to arrest um, and, and being placed into jail. Um, so I think Kara addressed that, but yeah, we suggest that you bring your medications um, and the prescriptions in particular. Okay, let's head to the next slide. And I wanna also let everyone know that we will be sending out an email after this and it will have these slides um, and some other resources so that you can continue learning, so you can continue sharing what you've learned with others. Um, okay, so packing to get ready. Um, everyone should have a backpack with them. Our goal is that we are all able to take care of ourselves and each other. Um, street medics and other organizers are definitely present um, and, and available and ready to support. Um, but if you can address those needs for yourself, so much the better. So water, um, I usually have a liter or two liters with me. Um, often there will be people sharing water or there'll be tables set up, um, but definitely bring enough. Please try not to dehydrate yourself. Um, that's something we really want to emphasize. And we'll talk a little bit in a sec about options for peeing and, and where to go. Okay, so you've got your water, you've got your body, and you've gotten dressed. Um, think about how identifiable your clothes are. Um, also think about layers. We are coming into a much colder season um, in a lot of places. Um, think about rain gear. Um, we also suggest that you bring an extra set of clothes, if possible, to change into for any chemical weapons exposure. Um, so think about your clothing. I think everyone should be wearing closed-toed shoes. Um, definitely bring shoes that you can walk a ways in and that will protect your feet. Bring a hat. If it's a warm hat, a sun hat, think about, think about what you're going to be out in. Um, sunscreen and bug spray. In terms of sunscreen, I have found that the face sunscreens are oil-free more commonly. Um, and so we're looking for a water-based sunscreen so that chemical weapons will not adhere as easily and stay on your skin. Um, for the most part, we suggest wearing few to no cosmetics or body products um, so, that, so that your skin um, will not hold on to those chemical weapons if you are exposed. And it is also the case that you will not always be exposed. Absolutely the case. Um, bandana or mask. This is extra relevant at this moment. A um, lot of different types of masks. You have disposable surgical masks, cloth masks, N95s, respirators, masks that are going to protect you from any tear gas or other chemical weapons. Um, so think about, think about what you want to do for that. Um, and then also making sure that if you have valves, that you've covered them up so that you're not exposing others um, through your mask to potential COVID transmission. Okay, um, goggles with a silicone gasket, um, if you are concerned about being exposed to chemical weapons. Um, rescue meds, so yeah, the albuterol, the EpiPen, bring those with you. Um, extra clothing, both for chemical weapons exposure and then also if it's a multi-day um, event and an emergency offsite contact. And so that's gonna be the person that you've said, I'm going out to this protest. Will you be my check-in buddy at the end? Um, and then the local National Lawyers Guild members. Um, and so these folks come out, they're wearing green hats um, and they're there to observe and document interactions between protesters and law enforcement. And 
for much of the summer, the number for the Seattle area one has been 206. Okay, try me. However, that number does change with some frequency. Um, so that is something that you should check out. That is also a line that has to be activated. And so this is going to be really context dependent on your location. Um, but we like to make sure everyone knows about that organization because they're huge supporters of your rights to protest. Um, okay, fidgets and stress relief items. Um, it can be really helpful to have something to kind of relieve a little bit of the anxiety or the stress that builds up. Um, folks have suggested that they bring headphones, they can take a little break and listen to music and then come back in. Um, that can, everyone's gonna be the expert for themselves, however. And then bringing some form of payment. So cash or your ATM card, your ID. Um, this is, you can, you can decide what you want to bring with you. Um, I think it's really important to have access to transportation and to food, um, to resources. And so I personally do bring all of the above, cash and credit card and my ID. Um, it is an option to not show your ID, although they will identify you. And I think that Kara probably has a good answer about bringing the ID or ID. You want to pop in for a moment? Yeah. So in the state of Washington, it actually is different by state. So it's important to look up the information in your state. Like I was born and raised in the state of Texas. And if you are over the age of 18, you need to have an ID on you at all times in the event that you are asked to show it. Um, but here in Washington state, you only need your ID on you if you are driving a motor vehicle, purchasing alcohol or marijuana or a firearm. Um, so those are the only times driving a vehicle and purchasing alcohol, tobacco, firearms, um, and weed, since that's legal here. Um, so you actually don't need your ID and you can decide amongst yourselves if that is something that you don't need in your jurisdiction, that you don't bring your IDs in solidarity with people who may be with you who are either undocumented or trans folks who are not able to change their gender markers on their ID and don't want to carry their ID. There's all kinds of reasons. Or somebody might have lost an ID and it's too expensive for them to get another one. Um, they might not have the funds for that. So there's all kinds of reasons people might not have it. So it's important to check your jurisdiction and then decide based on that information if you are or not or are not going to carry an ID. Okay. Shimona, could you please take us to the next slide. Okay, so for sharing with others, bring water, bring snacks, um, bring sunscreen bug spray, hand warmers, I love hot hands. They're like a really nice, if it's cold and unpleasant out, just having a little heater in your pockets, great. Um, eye flush water bottle and gloves. We are gonna talk about eye flushes a little bit later and we will include a video as well since in-person training is super limited at the moment. Um, but that is a way to get some relief um, from chemical weapons exposure. Cough drops are gonna be really beneficial for, especially for organ organizers or folks who are leading Mark Chance. Um, having those to hand out. Um, it, if you have created something about a know your rights um the kind of the flow chart about how to interact with police maybe you bring that with you um we also will be attaching some things that are printable and you can definitely bring both for your own use and reference and then to hand out um menstrual pads are going to be really helpful for a lot of folks um hand sanitizer like having a hairband is always a good idea um safety pins and then basic first aid items that you know how to use. So my favorite items are going to be band-aids, moleskin for if your shoes are rubbing or getting uncomfortable or you know that blister is about to start, um, water-based sunscreen, and then over-the-counter painkillers. So again, skip to your, stick to your scope of practice, but do think about what you might need and how you could care for yourself and others with the knowledge that you already have. Okay, um, something that we have seen that has been really cool is folks showing up at protests with wagons or shopping carts that are filled with 
packaged snacks, water bottles, sunscreen, first aid kits, um, or even so much as like helmets and umbrellas and gas masks. Um, so if that is something you want to do is bring a snack cart with you, you can, you can push that through. Um, and we definitely encourage like more sharing and more care for each other. Um, I also think that, so we haven't said so far to bring your cell phone. Um, and this is kind of a complicated topic that we're not going to get too far into. Um, but your cell phone location can be used to track you and to put you at a protest and potentially charge you with something. Or it can also be used against others. Um, so this is a much larger question to think about. I personally do bring my phone. I turn off the location sharing, um, which is a little bit of a reduction of risk. However, it can still be tracked. Um, so... I think it's really important though to do a little bit of research before you go out and then have have that knowledge for when you're out and so maybe you have your phone or maybe you don't um that is that's going to be a personal decision or maybe a decision on the part of an action if you're part of a specific group um but i have a couple of kind of websites or genres that i suggest folks spend some time with um so for protests twitter is the social media site that i find most useful um, so trying to find the local journalists who are covering protests um, and trying to find out who the streamers are. So the people who are live streaming um, at protests, that can be a way to kind of find out where something is um, or to see who's speaking. So you can be watching that from home, but you can also follow them on social media. Um, and that will give you a little bit more history and a little bit more understanding of the current movement. Um, check the weather. For sure, check the weather. Um, that's going to be helpful. Of course, it changes, but that's a useful one. Check out the local mutual aid networks near you and see who's doing that work. Um, that may be a way for you to seek support or to offer support. Um, as it is right now, check the air quality. See if that is a risk that you're willing to take. If you, um, I think, yeah, a lot of people are choosing not to be out in the streets, even though we've had very long-term protest movements this summer. Um, it's, it's not healthy to be outside currently in most of the West Coast. Um, and then check the COVID metrics in your area. That's going to be another way to give you a little bit more knowledge and support an educated risk assessment. Um, so... I think that mostly concludes the preparing to go out, kind of thinking about what you're going to bring with you, what relationship building you're going to do beforehand. Um, and we're going to move on into just a little bit more about getting ready to go out, and then we'll move to the action. Okay. So um, one of the things that Alice had mentioned that's really important is to decide who you're going to tell. Um, so definitely keep that in mind and think about who you could tell and also think about how they may feel about it. Um, you know, you may have friends or family who may not agree with your decision to go out. And if that's the case, then, um, you know, maybe that might not be the best person. Think of somebody who you could possibly tell that would be okay and be supportive or maybe you have friends that don't necessarily support it but would still be willing to understand the safety concerns of you needing to have somebody to check in with so think about that um, I wanted to address a question that had come up since this is kind of about planning uh, this question in the chat let me get back to it um, where we'd love to hear thoughts on safety at actions in rural areas smaller protest rally groups with predominantly white participants, a lot of interaction, direct or indirect, with right-wingers. Um, so this is a really important thing to think about, and it's actually been something, um, for example, in Portland, I've medic down in Portland before, and Portland has been seeing this for years. Um, I think for some people, it is kind of newer to understand that right-wing protesters have been showing up armed and violent at things, but it's actually been happening for years. And so there have been ways that people have sort of tried to 
mitigate that. And it is going to be especially harder in smaller and rural areas because there is safety in numbers. And if you live in a smaller place, you just, even if everybody in the whole town showed up, it wouldn't be uh, really helpful for, um, you know, there still wouldn't be enough numbers. It would be kind of a situation you have to think about. So some of that information um, is, you know, you're just going to have to think for yourself and for your community what works best. Um, there are just, it's really important to have a lot of people scouting. Scouting is important, especially during an action. Um, people can be kind of looking around and saying, that they're noticing people coming who may be dangerous and you can decide as a group what to do about that. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that in certain places, wearing bulletproof vests over your clothes is actually illegal. Um, so some people that are showing up in like this gear, like tactical gear ready to fight. Um, unfortunately, when it is right wing fascist, uh, the police are in collusion with them a lot of times. So they're allowed to do whatever they want. Um, but if you are a person who thinks, well, maybe I'll show up with my bulletproof vest to be protected. Um, just know that in some jurisdictions, that's illegal. So that's not necessarily a solution. So you may need to in smaller areas, really talk to the folks who are sympathetic for your causes and who are willing to do what you want to do and show up at the protest you want to show up at um, and try to come up with different safety plans that work for you. Unfortunately, there's not when the people showing up to cause you harm are people that the state agrees with and the police are the state in this scenario. It's hard. And that's why like defund the police, abolish the police. Like these are important messages to talk about is because the police are helping these others um, to do that, to um, show up and be violent. And they get escorted away after murdering people. We've seen that if you've seen what happened in Wisconsin. Um, so it really is about, this is about, you know, making sure you have buddies, making sure that you are building relationships within your movement um, and really taking into consideration what works best for your community. That's kind of the best answer I can think of at this time. Um, and there's a question in regards to scouting, the best method to discern if information is real or current before passing it along and how to identify the urgency without being alarmist. We're actually gonna address that a little further down in the spreading calm and rumor control section. It's one of my favorite sections. So I'm gonna try not to jump the gun and talk about it now, but it is, um, that's a really great question and we will for sure be bringing that up. Um, the final thing I want to mention about before going into the action, and this kind of ties into that question of like rural and smaller areas and what's going to be happening, is to really ask yourself some questions and use some self-reflection techniques before you go out to figure out what are your intentions of joining? Uh, what is your goal in the action? And what are the stated goals of the action itself? And think about all those things and then try to decide how they align. Um, if your intention in joining is because you think the cause is really important and you want to show up for that and you will show up and be present in whatever way is needed at the time, then it's good to know that. And if your goal is to make your voice heard, even if the police show up, even if it gets chaotic, then you'll have a better feeling of being prepared and you'll be able to handle some of the waves of pressure that could come at you in a different way. Um, and thinking about the goals of the action. If someone has um, said, here's an action and we're gonna show up and bring noisemakers and just be really loud and try to have this noise demo um, and that sounds really good to you, then feel free to do it. If somebody says, we're going to have this action and our intention is to tear this building down brick by brick, we're going to destroy property, and you don't feel that resonates with you, you don't have to go. But what's really important is that you don't go rather than to go and to try to stop people from doing things and to really like 
try to make the action into what your goal is, um, it's really important to note that you know your intentions, you know what your goal is, the organizers may have a goal and figuring out how all of that aligns before you go somewhere so that there's not any additional stress that you feel if things aren't going as planned or you are not in line with what's happening. Um, so that's kind of it for things to think about before the action. There's a million things we could say, but I think that's, that's good. I'm going to let Alice talk about some things that are happening at the action. Okay, so you've arrived. Um, some of the people that are going to be there, we're going to talk about a couple of the different groups of people and then um, some of the resources that we suggest looking out for. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit more about the weather and environmental aspects um, and some of our favorite topics like spreading calm. So you're going to find the National Lawyers Guild in Green Hats. Um, those folks typically don't interact much with anyone because they're like very much occupied with observing and documenting. You're going to find the perhaps a first aid or a medic tent um, at kind of a larger action. Um, and we encourage you to check in with folks. Um, you are going to find organizers. Um, there will be, yeah, folks that have put this on that are leading chants or leading the march. Um, we want to, like, remember that all social movement relies on a diversity of tactics. Um, and as Kara said, we really, yeah, it is not our role. If you're not the organizer, it's not your role to necessarily critique or to try to police the organizers. Um, I think that as a white person myself, this is something that I think about as kind of the way that um, I am inclined towards policing myself and others. Um, so potentially that can be part of your pre going out work um, is thinking about the way that that is part of your psyche. Um, there may be a group called the Bike Brigade in Seattle, or we heard street riders in New York City. So these are folks that are blocking off streets, um, using themselves and their bicycle to do traffic control, to build a perimeter around an action or the organizers to provide safety for folks who are protesting. Um, and so in Seattle, it's a fairly organized group. Again, this is gonna be really dependent on where you are. Um, and I really appreciate the question about rural areas as well, because my experience is very much in a city with a long history of protesting. Um, so there is a lot more organization. And so that's just helping point out something that I don't actually know much about. Um, there is often a role called the police liaison. Um, and typically that's going to be one of the organizers who's playing that role um, of speaking with, and communicating with the police. And if it's not you, we recommend that you don't talk to the cops. Um, again, this is really coming from my urban standpoint, my urban protesting standpoint. So I do wanna be clear about that. Um, so those are some of the folks that you're gonna come in to contact with. Um, something that we suggest is when you arrive, going and checking out what resources are in the area. So this is extra hard and perhaps extra important in this um, particular pandemic. Oftentimes we really like to use libraries as a place to either take a break or get a kind of a safe spot or use the bathroom. That is barely an option. Um, we really wanna encourage folks not to dehydrate themselves. So that involves finding places to use the restroom. Um, that can be potentially restaurants that are like friendly to the cause. Um, oftentimes you can find out who those are because they'll be sharing food or water or drinks. Um, that is fairly common. Um, my new favorite place as of this summer is going to construction sites. And so this is a Kara innovation and peeing there. So they provide cover but we're also really conscientious of how our urine is going to affect workers. Um, so that is 
going to be a good spot. Parks. Um, of course, like you may need to, you're going to have your buddy. And so you can potentially use each other as shields, as some level of protection. Um, and then some places do have public bathrooms. That's awesome. Um, so when you arrive, find out where you're going to be able to go to the bathroom. Um, if you're in a place that you haven't been before, or maybe a place that you're not as familiar with, check out where the hospitals are or where maybe an ER is. Um, have some familiarity with that in case you need that information. Um, again, seek out what businesses um, may be friendly or available for you. Um, and think seriously about your transportation options. Um, oftentimes, a march will start one place but will end another. Um, so things to think about. Are you willing to take the bus? Are you able to take the bus? Do you have bus fare? Is the bus charging? Um, are you able or willing to use a ride sharing app like Lyft or Uber? Do you have a friend who said, I can't be there, but give me a call and we'll do a masked windows down ride. That's going to be an excellent option. Um, so thinking about cars and different forms of transportation so that you can make sure that you get where you need to be and so that you can get to safety if you need that as well. Um, so yeah, some of the things to just kind of take a look at, think about as you arrive. All right, Kara. Unmute, okay, <laughs> figured out how to use my laptop. Um, so yeah, just wanted to throw in a couple things in the chat that folks had mentioned as additional roles, uh, clergy as witnesses and observers, and some kind of security group or individuals. So those are some other infrastructure type of pieces you may see. Um, someone did also ask about connecting with fellow activists and connecting via Telegram or Signal or using Tor browsers and other privacy issues. That is actually um, something that would be talked about in a security culture training, and it is an entire training all to itself. Um, there is an upcoming one, so we're going to pop a link in the chat. Maybe, Alice, if you want to pop that in right now. Um, there are some 350 Seattle trainings that are happening soon, and so uh, that will hopefully address more of that information for you. Um, but yes, it's important to think about security for sure, um, because state repression is very real. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit now about weather and the environment. Um, this is something that's really important, and it changes depending on what season you're protesting in. Um, and it's also very dependent on where you are in the world. Um, so a lot of, I'm going to try to be very general and broad since I know we're coming from so many different places right now, but there are some key things that I'll talk about that are, doesn't matter where you live, you need to know your body and your own needs. So it's very important that if you know you're a person who gets cold really easily, even if it's 60 degrees outside, for some people that sounds like great t-shirt weather, I need a light jacket in 60 degree weather. Like I would not be able to be out there in a t-shirt. I would get cold. I would get miserable. And then I get hangry and grumpy and it's all over. So think about for you, what works for you. Some of those things that Alice had mentioned that you should bring when you're packing for the protest. It's going to really depend on you, your body, what you need and the weather. That's why it's important to check the weather before you go. Is a rainstorm coming soon? Maybe bring a rain jacket. Um, so a key piece of this is anticipate, um, and action sometimes can turn out to be much longer than you thought they would be. So anticipate even further. Uh, you may get really caught up in the moment of being at something. I know I was at the very first evening that Seattle began protesting after George Floyd was murdered. Um, I went to that thinking it would be some hours. My medic buddy and I showed up and we were ready to go and it actually kept going and there was a march and it split into multiple marches and then we were outside the youth jail and people were doing a die-in and all this other stuff was happening and suddenly it was like after midnight and they were like okay we're gonna march to the next place <laughs> and I don't know what we thought but we did not quite think that it was gonna keep going that late um and we ended up needing to leave and so that's fine like this is, I tell this story because even when you know 
that you should anticipate for things to be longer than you expect, you still could find yourself in a situation where you're like, you know what, this is even longer than I'm prepared for, not going to do it. Um, so just really think about those things. Think about the weather, how many snacks you may need, or like Alice said, bring money to buy snacks or call a friend who might be able to bring you snacks. Um, the key thing to think about is hydration. Do not try to dehydrate yourself so you don't have to pee. Like, if you have to, wear diapers. Some of the direct action folks, if you know any, like, anti-nuclear activists from back in the day and, you know, lots of climate activists, tree sitters, different people, you can wear diapers. Um, it's weird as an adult, maybe. I felt weird about it at the time when I was involved in the direct action and that was the thing that I had to do, but... Um, it's something to think about. Like if you don't know what's going to happen, if you are doing some kind of direct action or sit in and you want to be able to stay as long as possible, it is more important that you drink water and keep your body healthy so that all of your systems can function properly. That is more important than the weirdness you may feel about wearing a diaper as an adult who maybe doesn't need to wear a diaper. Um, so think about that and also think about food. You do need to eat. So if you're going out to a march that starts at four in the afternoon, dinner time is coming. And you can eat snacks for a while. And you can eat snacks for a little bit longer. But eventually, like, you're really going to need to eat. Especially if something turns into something longer or it turns into a march and you're marching all around your city or town or you're doing something else. Like, it's really important to think about these things. Um, and so think about your food, eat before you go, if you can, if that's useful, but then also remember the parts I am. Yes. Right now I'm going to talk about poop. Um, you will need to poop somewhere quite possibly. So think about that. Like, are all the places closed for COVID? Are there no, like I know in Seattle when a lot of things started, everything was closed. Porta potties hadn't started showing up at different places. And so people who needed to go to the bathroom were where are you going to go? What are you going to do about that? So think about these things in advance, but do not deny your body the things it needs to do its processes. Um, so I'm going to do a quick little bit, Shimona, if you could please start the next slide. Um, it is slide number five. Um, <laughs> I'm going to talk a bit about heat-related illness. Um, and I'm going to kind of browse through this because we've also added a slide on hypothermia as it is starting to get cooler in some places. Um, and this will definitely, this uprising is continuing and we may need to be doing a lot after the November election. So it's important to think about all these things um, because weather related illnesses can happen very quickly and you might not notice it's happening, but they actually can result in death. And that is not to scare you. It is just to be aware. Um, I am also a wilderness first responder. And so I have trained a lot in this. And this is some of this information is really important in wilderness settings. And sometimes being at a protest is, for all intents and purposes, the wilderness, even if it's the city. Um, so you really want to know some of these signs. So heat-related illness, you have uh, heat exhaustion which can lead to a heat stroke, which can kill you. Heat exhaustion um, can make you really sick. Um, and so you'll start to see things like you could get a headache. Uh, you could start to feel really weak. you could be sweating a lot and have some muscle cramps. Um, also, it can happen that you start to feel kind of confused and dizzy. So if someone that you're with starts exhibiting any of these signs and you know it's really hot, um, it's important to ask them, hey, have you had some water today? Or like, maybe we can step away from this crowd really far so you can take your mask off and breathe a little bit and just like come sit under this tree in the shade because that's what you want to do. You want to move to a shaded location. Um, you want to take as much of their clothing as possible off, um, especially things like socks and shoes so they can have more airflow um, if they're wearing any kind of jacket because it was maybe slightly cool at some point, make sure to take that off. Um, you can apply other cool cloths or ice to your head 
or spray cool water on yourself if you have some extra water. Um, and definitely drink water. And you can drink juice or a sports drink. Um, we've been really lucky in Seattle that a lot of people have been bringing not only bottled water, but there has been a, there was a lot of like Gatorade and stuff early on in the summer. Um, so you can find something like that to help with this problem. Um, and if somebody doesn't feel better or they're really not changing in any of these symptoms, you'll want to find a medic. Either find somebody marked as a medic, um, call somebody you know who may have some medical training, call somebody with a car to try to take this person somewhere. Um, if it has progressed to heat stroke, which is where some of this gets um, really intense, like they could get, instead of just confusion, they could get very combative if they are trying to fight you because you're asking them to drink water and that's not a usual thing for them because some people are just combative by nature. But if that's not usual for your friend, you'll really want to make sure they get help immediately. Um, so these are just some things to really think about and know some of these. And like we've mentioned, we are going to send these slides out so you can kind of look at these symptoms and remember them. Um, next slide, please, Shimona. Hypothermia is what could happen in the future months of these things that we're going to be seeing. So this is when your body's core temperature gets way colder than your normal brain or muscle function is ready to handle. And so you'll start to lose some of that. Um, you know, hypothermia actually can come at a much higher temperature, air temperature than you expect. Um, and the thing about both of these that's important to mention is that exposure is cumulative. So if you are out in the heat or the cold day one of the protest and you feel fine, but you keep coming out every single day and then it's day six or seven, you may suddenly get one of these heat exhaustion or hypothermia because your body has been building up and having a hard time regulating itself. So it's really important to note the signs and symptoms. Um, hypothermia will be a sensation of cold and shivering, kind of like an uncontrollable shivering. Um, you'll get what's called the umbles, where you're stumbling, mumbling, fumbling. Uh, if you're having trouble walking, you're kind of slurring your speech. Um, if you're trying to put on your jacket and you can't actually zip your jacket, but you are more commonly having motor functions that do allow you to zip your jacket, it could be a sign that you're getting hypothermia. Um, and you can also start, <sighs> apathy is big. People are like, I don't care that it's cold. It's fine, whatever. I'm cold, yeah, but like, I don't care. Um, their brain is starting to lose some of that temperature and they're not being able to operate as they often do. Um, so the care and treatment for hypothermia is you want to move somebody to a dry and warm environment, take off any wet clothing they may have if it was raining or if they were sweating at some point because maybe you walked a lot and were marching, but then the sweat started cooling off and their clothing is wet. You'll want to take that off and put on dry and insulating layers. Um, this is where those hot hands, the heat packs and things are really useful to have because you can put those on the armpits and chest or wherever it might feel good to them. Um, and eat a meal and drink warm and sweet non-caffeinated beverages to try to raise that internal temperature. And so that is going to really help you um, try to get out of that hypothermic state. If any of that um, isn't working and people are still shivering, if someone's shivering uncontrollably and then they stop shivering but are still cold, that is a very bad sign. Um, shivering shouldn't stop for that. Um, the reason that sweetness is important in the warm drinks is because it's the caloric value that starts your body processes through their whole work. I said that very badly. <laughs> um, Alice, do you have a better way to say what I'm saying? <laughs> it's all about the calories. There you go. Yeah. Um, so that does, it just helps your body start working. When you consume calories, your body starts working and it will start to circulate the blood and like warm itself up more. Um, so those are some very important symptoms and things to be aware of and make sure you're watching out for each other. This is why it's important to have a buddy because you can be looking for this in your buddy. Your buddy can be looking for it in you. 
and you'll kind of know what your baseline is. Because if you just come up on somebody and you see something that may be one of these symptoms, you might not know the person. It could be like shivering. Somebody could have Parkinson's and is having some kind of shaking moment. And you might think they're shivering from hypothermia, but that could just be something that is common to them. So it's important to have that buddy so you can really know what your friends are doing. Um, so... Yeah, that is it for the slides now. We're good on those. Um, so yeah, just keep aware of your body when you're out and just watch for any sudden shifts in mood and demeanor. It could also be an emotional situation. If suddenly you're with a friend and your friend starts giving really short answers and is really grumpy, um, it could just be that they are really stressed out. Maybe they haven't had a snack in a long time. Um, all kinds of things like that. So just pay attention. Um, one of the things that we want to mention at an action that we've seen a lot, and it's important to think about kind of before you go out, is that in this moment in particular, a really common tactic is when the organizers of an action will call white bodies to the front. So if you've ever been at a protest and they say, uh, white people come up here and like stand in line in front of the police. Um, this is to help black people, other people of color to have some space from the police and that violence that's happening. Um, the people who are the most harmed by the systems that we have in place right now, it can be a really good tactic to sort of make this protective layer. Um, so it's important to consider if you are white or white passing, or maybe you are a person of color who is not black and wants to, in this particular moment, support black people. Um, that's really up to you to decide and to also take into some of those considerations that we mentioned before about arrestability, um, about any different physical vulnerabilities or things you might experience. But think of the importance of that if you are asked to do it it's important to think about um, how you will, will respond to that request. And it's also important to know that th we're not at all saying that by not doing it, that you are somehow failing or that it's a problem. There's all kinds of reasons where people are not able to go to the front lines. And some of it is just personal fear. It's terrifying to face off riot police. Um, I definitely very clearly remember the first time that I ever had to face off riot police to their faces and that was a thing. But in that moment, I had already thought about it. I made the decision to do it. And I still stand by to myself that that was an important and correct decision for me to make. But there may be a reason you can't make that decision. And that's fine. Just think about it in advance, especially in these moments where we are seeing Black people finally be listened to about how much violence they've experienced. Um, so think about that and how you would respond. Um, so that is some of the things to think about when you're at the action. And now we're gonna talk about my favorite section about spreading calm and rumor control. So this is actually, Shimona, if you could please go to slide number seven. Um, one of the things that street medics are trained to do is to spread calm and this is a very important thing and it's actually the best thing is that it's not just street medics that do this and it's our favorite thing when you all can help us do it um, you want to spread calm because the number one weapon of the police is fear they want you to be afraid they want you to make rash decisions or to run away and go home because then they get to keep doing what they're doing. The system stays in place as it is and nothing changes. And so they want you to be afraid. But we are so much stronger together and we can stand together through anything with knowing that they are using fear to try to get us. Um, and yes, someone asked if that's true with white supremacists building on fear. Absolutely. That is there. That's part of the status quo is the white supremacy culture that we live under. 
And so they want everyone to be afraid. And it's okay to be afraid. Like, they're terrifying. It's terrifying when police with all these guns and tear gas canisters show up and they're, like, in your face, especially when you know you were just standing there protesting injustice and doing what we all have constitutional rights to do. They want you to be afraid, but move through that fear and spread calm and stay together and we will be much stronger than them. Um, so you really want to think about the ways that you are spreading calm. Um, a very common, probably the thing I said the most this summer that like I got hoarse from saying <laughs> was walk, don't run. So when things start happening, when police start shooting flashbangs and tear gas and it gets really chaotic, don't run away. It's just like the yelling fire in a crowded theater. People are going to get trampled when people are running. You might trip over something, especially like the tear gas canisters and the flashbangs. They're like rolling around on the ground. So you might run and trip over one. You might trip over a curb. You might trip over somebody's wagon that they forgot to take with them when they started running. Um, it's really important to try to center yourself and walk away. Um, so that spreading calm, you can help by asking other people to walk and to lead by example and to be walking. Um, these are really important things to do. Um, Shimona, could you go to the next slide, please? And another important way to spread calm is rumor control. And this is a question that was asked before about how to like figure out what information you have, if it's real and the best way to share it. So you really want to spread information and not panic. Um, what I saw a lot of in Seattle earlier this summer was a lot of folks who were new to showing up in the streets and they would hear something and they would start yelling it and then everybody would tell everybody and everybody would tell everybody. And um, I've actually seen this a lot at protests, like even pre the summer's uprising, um, people will say, I just heard there's like 70 riot cops coming towards us. That, that may be true, but it also may be not true. Um, like that particular instance where somebody told me there was 70 riot cops coming towards us, um, they had just heard from some thread that somebody saw some cops and somebody said, I don't know, they're probably riot cops. And somebody said, there's probably like a bunch of them because they know how many people are at this event. And then finally, when somebody, we sent a scout out to go look at the corner where the 70 riot cops were and there were literally zero cops. Um, about 20 minutes later, about 10 cops in riot gear came from a different location but the whole, there's 70 riot cops coming for us. Everybody started freaking out and running around. And it wasn't helpful because you want to try to maintain that calm, even when you know, like, okay, this may be the time that we're about to get, you know, arrested. We're about to experience chemical weapons. You just want to try to not let that escalation happen and to have all your fight or flight senses really go into activation mode. So spreading information is important. Um, and this salute is a really helpful thing to remember. Um, acronyms seem to be really cool and helpful in this world. Uh, so the first thing you want to talk about is the size and strength. You want to say how many people there are, like that you have observed. Um, I have observed five to six armed agitators. What are their actions or their activities? They're harassing random people on the move. They're sitting in a van, staring at the protest. They're, whatever it is they're doing, what are they doing? Their location and direction. Where are they? They're at this corner, they're not moving, or they're at this corner and they're walking towards this corner. Um, what are they wearing so that people can look at them? The uniform, the clothes. Um, like one of the things I kept hearing a lot in Seattle was the Proud Boys are coming but the thing is, is that the Proud Boys are one group. There's also Patriot Prayer and the Three Percenters and the Oath Keepers. There's a lot of them. And people were just using that as like a catch-all term. And overall, it's kind of the same, but also it's 
really important to kind of be as specific as possible because they have different ways of interacting. So, you know, you can say what they're wearing, like the Proud Boys have this very particular like black polo with these yellow stripes. Um, they've stopped wearing them a bit because people recognize their clothes as that. And so um, sometimes they'll just come out in regular clothes to try to blend in. But if they are wearing something distinguishable, it's especially important to note that. And then also include the date and the time of observation, especially when a lot of people are in a place altogether. Uh, messages might not go through when you think they will. So I know a lot of times on some medic signal threads that I've been on, we'll send something and always include the time so that in case it doesn't come through for 10 minutes, then we'll be able to see, okay, this actually was from 10 minutes ago. So things may have changed. Um, and then also mention the equipment and weapons. Like, do you see anything? Not just, I bet they're armed because they're white supremacists. You want to make sure you see that they are armed. I think people all generally understand that it's possible that white supremacists could be armed. Um, but it's important. It's really important, especially for that rumor control and spreading calm to not necessarily share that they are armed if you don't know that. Um, one thing that was happening a lot also is because the Seattle police figured out that a lot of people were listening to their scanner and then they were people like movement people were posting on Twitter. Oh, I heard the police scanner said this. The police scanner said that the police were lying on their scanner. They were making things up. They were like, this person has a gun. Um, and it wasn't true. They were just trying to get people to freak out and leave because some people were like, I don't want to be at a protest where somebody has a gun. I'm going home. And then that lowers your numbers and gives them more space to come in and clear the area. So it's really important um, to think of these things when you're sharing information and think about where you're getting it from. Like it is important to follow the Twitter and the live streamers and to know that with the information they're saying to like wonder, is it correct? Because sometimes it could be that they are, if it's police, if the police are in any way involved, they're lying to you. The police are allowed to lie to you. You are not allowed to lie the, to the police. So it's important to know where you got the information. Um, if somebody that you know is your friend that is sitting there like watching from a street corner, that's another thing. You can have friends scouting from all over and they can be sending you information. Make sure they know this salute um, acronym and think of the ways that they can give you the best information possible. So with that, um, Shimona, if you could please go to the next slide. We're going to talk about chemical weapons. Um, this is a topic that can be the biggest rabbit hole of any health and safety training ever. Um, I know people have a lot of questions about chemical weapons, a lot of very specific questions, and a lot of stories. Um, this is where the training kind of derails a lot of times in person because everyone has a story they want to tell about a thing that they saw or what happened. Um, and so we're just going to go over some basic information that is really important for you to know um, and try not to go down too many rabbit holes, even though it's really easy. Um, because there are a lot of different formulas and different chemical weapons that are deployed. So it actually varies from police department to police department, and then their formulations can change over time. Like in Seattle, we hadn't seen tear gas since the WTO protests of 99. And then they started using it this summer. It's probably the same tear gas has been sitting in a warehouse since 99, and then they got in trouble for it, and then they stopped using it, and now they're using expired tear gas. Um, and so it's really not helpful. A lot of times people want to get into the science of like, let's talk about this, let's talk about that. Um, for all intents and purposes, pepper spray and tear gas can be thought of in basically the same way. They are chemical irritants that affect your eyes, your lungs, your skin. Um, and the main goal is that you want to get that off of your eyes and your skin. Um, you want to get out of your lungs, but that's just going to take some time. You can't clear your lungs in the street. Uh, but you can move away from the cloud or have something to cover your face. So we're 
in this moment of a pandemic, it's actually kind of helpful that you may already have a mask on. Um, though then that mask, if it's paper or cloth, is getting contaminated with the chemical weapons. Um, and so you want to think about that. Um, and this is why some people are wearing respirators and such. So uh, things to think about when you are going out. Um, somebody had asked a question earlier about if you should wear contacts or glasses. This person didn't want their glasses to get broken, but also said, I think contacts might be bad with chemical weapons. They absolutely are. You do not want to wear contacts to an action if there is a potential of chemical weapons deployment. Um, in the event that you do have contacts, you need to get them out of your eye before somebody flushes your eye. Um, if not, it's possible that contact could get flushed back into your eye, like back, back, back in there, and it needs to be removed in a hospital setting. Um, and then all that tear gas or pepper spray is trapped underneath it. So you do not want that to happen. Uh, wear your glasses. They may get broken. Might be important to have a buddy so that if you really like can't see, like I wear glasses because I can't see things that are far away. Um, I have been thrown on the ground by police and my glasses were lost, but I could still see close up so it wasn't super bad. Um, but if you really have worse eyesight that you have to have those corrective lenses, have somebody with you in case it happens, but don't wear contacts. Um, you also want to have considerations with asthma. If you have asthma, you want to know where your inhaler is, and hopefully your buddy can help you get it. Um, so these are some really important things to think about when you're possibly going to be exposed. Um, so the main thing is you want to minimize your exposure. If it starts happening, walk as slowly as possible away from the area to minimize your exposure. Um, you can either do an eye flush or find a street medic who can help you flush your eyes. Um, we will be sending around in the follow-up a uh, video. It's hard to show the video on Zoom. Um, unfortunately, in person, we would do a demo and then have you do the demo. But when we send this video around, if you have somebody in your Corona pod that's willing to let you practice this, y'all can practice it on each other. It would be really helpful to practice before you're out in the streets and need to do it. Um, if you are doing it to help somebody, you definitely want to wear gloves and you want to change your gloves between people that you're flushing, and you want to have a squirt top bottle. Um, you want to rinse your mouth out, and you can spit the water out, and rinse your hands, don't touch your face. Um, so try to like not be rubbing it back all over yourself. Um, as street medics, we say that plain water is the most effective, and it is safe, and it is easily accessible in most places. Um, we saw a lot this summer people using milk that is not necessarily a good idea. Milk can cause bacteria infections um, in the summer. It can start to go bad when you're just carrying it around and then you're going to pour like rotten milk in somebody's eyes. Um, and it can cause chemical burns if people are lactose intolerant and it gets into their mouth and they're like highly lactose intolerant. It could make them sick. Um, I've met vegans who don't want milk poured on their face. Um, it's just not a good idea. And I only mention it because so many people ask about it. Um, I really wish I didn't even have to talk about it because then people in their mind will be like, well, what about, but milk, like when you eat a hot pepper and then you drink milk. Yes, it's true that pepper spray is capsaicin, but it's not the same. So please just use water. Actually, what is relieving the pain is the flushing mechanism. So to get a squirt top water bottle, either like a bicycle water bottle or one of those water bottles with the squirt top. Um, but it's important to remember if you do that, label that bottle as your eye flush bottle and do not ever drink out of it. Do not ever drink out of it. Um, and if it is one of the plastic ones, you could just, you know, recycle it and find a new one for the next time. Um, whatever you want to do, but just be very careful that you're not cross contaminating. So we're going to send this. This will be there so you can kind of read up a little more about it. Um, it's just really important to remember the thing about contacts, remember asthma, and um, to really think about like how you want to help folks if this happens. If you feel comfortable learning eye flushes, you should definitely do it. Um, so I'm going to let Alice now talk about some post-action care. 
All right, so you're heading home. If you have been exposed to chemical weapons, um, we suggest that you be really cautious about exposing others um, because they will remain on your skin, on your clothes. Um, so changing into that other clothing, if you have it, um, trying to avoid exposing the person who's driving your bus or who's in the car with you. Um, if possible, leave your clothes outside or in a bag and wash them a couple times. If anything can't be washed, leave it outside for a number of days until it is let the has off gassed. Um, we also recognize that sometimes that's not possible and sometimes we make decisions to wear that same clothing the next day um, because you know that you're gonna be exposed again. Um, so if possible, bag it, wash it multiple times. Um, and when you arrive home, take a lukewarm shower. Um, this is so that you don't open your pores as much and potentially increase your exposure to the chemical weapon that remains on your skin. Um, when you leave a protest or an action, oftentimes you've had perhaps adrenaline, um, you've been maybe at a higher risk than your normal life puts you at, um, there have been maybe people that have been trying to antagonize you or there have been police interactions. Um, so it's really important to provide care for yourself. And one concept that I love to think about um, was shared by Crystal on the Read, um, one of my favorite podcasts. She suggests that you think of yourself as like a six-year-old that you must take care of. And so when I'm really struggling, I can take care of other people. It's really harder for me to take care of myself. Um, so imagine yourself as that six-year-old that needs to be fed, that needs to drink a lot of water because they're dehydrated, and that needs to get some rest. Um, in terms of food, consider what you're going to eat perhaps before you go out. Maybe someone's making you something. Maybe you make yourself something so that it's all ready when you get home. Or maybe you stop at the drive through or get some takeout. Um, I find it really hard to feed myself and care for myself after being out in the streets. Um, so I think it's worthwhile to think about what you're going to eat before you leave. Um, so eat some food, drink some water, get some rest, and then get some emotional care. Um, so that could be from someone that has already agreed to do so. Um, that could be through writing, through doing movement, um, thinking about the ways that you like to care for yourself, um, and being prepared to ask for support from others. Um, I, let's see, I want to take two minutes for folks to put in the chat um, ways that you care for yourself, ways that you get emotional care. Um, so some of the things that you like to do for yourself. So we're going to just take two minutes, throw them into the chat, um, and I'll read them aloud as I see them. And at that point, we're going to have just a couple more minutes, and we'll ask a couple questions, and then we'll be all done for the evening. So what do you like to do to care for yourself after coming home? So yeah, we have hug my kids, pet my dog, lie in bed and read a favorite children's book, take a walk with my dog, I gotta get a dog or a cat. Music, tell my story. Yeah, I, I think storytelling, that's a big one. We've got more music, walk in the garden or woods, walk in nature. Music or movies that will make you cry so you listen and watch them. Yeah, taking a bath. I like to take a bath and sit as the water drains out and kind of imagine what I'm letting drain out with the water. Um, as just kind of a, a way to make physical that release. Meditate on an inspirational passage, blues guitar, read mindless stuff, get plenty of sleep, exercise, bike ride, care for and pet my cats, sit in my hammock, listen to podcasts, long walks. Yeah, you are all experts. Yoga. Excellent. So I really want everyone to think about the ways that you care for yourself and who can help support you and care for you in this important and really challenging, intense emotional work. Um, so while this section 
is short, it is also perhaps the longest section. Think about how you can be also caring for others. Um, yeah. Okay. So, Kara, do you want to take two minutes? Yeah. I'm going to do just a very quick run through on some of the things about um, demystifying jail. Though okay, I we can also take down, sorry, we can take oh. down the slides. Oh, yeah. We'll leave them with slides. slides. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to do a quick little bit about demystifying some of the things about jail, though I will say that uh, trainings link that we sent before, um, Ellen and I, one of my comrades, we're doing a training on September 30th about this. It's going to be way more in depth. So if you have questions about that segment, come to that training. Um, so one of the things Alice had mentioned was the National Lawyers Guild. And that is something that in your area, you might want to check and see if there's a chapter. Um, you can see how close one is to you if you're in a rural, a rural area. Um, there may be some nearby. These are lawyers who really, really, truly believe in your First Amendment right to protest, and they will help you as much as they can, um, sometimes up to and including offering pro bono legal services for folks who've been arrested if they're able to do that. Um, so if there is a hotline that they would set up, like here in Seattle, the protocol used to be you had to ask them uh, you would tell them the date and location of your action and the time, and you would ask them to set up the hotline so that if folks got arrested, they could call. Um, this summer, they had been leaving the number on consistently, but that's not always the case, so you'll want to check in your area. Um, and if that does happen, you'll want to write that number in Sharpie on your body somewhere. Um, and think about maybe a lot of people put it on their arms, and you see a lot of pictures of folks with uh, Sharpie numbers on their arms. But remember that then the police will see you with a big Sharpie number written on your arm and they might automatically assume, hey, you were at this protest because who else writes numbers on their arm really big in Sharpie? Um, so maybe write it on your leg or your stomach or somewhere that you'll be able to find it in jail, but um, it's maybe not so obvious. And learn who your local protest supporters are. Like, are there people that do jail support, or are there people, legal organizations that will offer legal advice? Um, are there bail funds or organizers who are willing to set that up? So look in your area for things like that. It's really important, even if you've already had a Know Your Rights training many years ago, because I know some folks might be stepping back into this after a long pause, um, but especially if you've never had one, go to a Know Your Rights training. There's actually one tomorrow on that training's information that we sent out uh, through the 350 Seattle Pleasure Resistance Training. Um, so that's something that you may really want to brush up on. The CLDC has a recorded one, the Civil Liberties Defense Center out of Eugene, Oregon. Um, and we can send that around. It's over an hour. It's a video, but it's really important to know these things. Um, so just really think about that and to know that even if you are arrested and go to jail, um, that's part of the fear that they're trying to instill in you. And it's terrifying. But if you are out there and like choosing to stand up for what you believe in, think of all the people who get thrown in jail every day for nothing. Some people are literally in jail because they don't have money and didn't pay traffic tickets. And that to me is abhorrent. Um, and so the times that I've been to jail <laughs> from a protest, I'm just like, yep, here I am taking up this space that somebody else could have had. Um, so think about that um, and just how you want to set up your jail scenario in the event you get arrested and how you uh, want to move forward with that by looking up a lot of these resources. So I think we are now at this point, Alice. Okay, with that, we have two final goals. If there are questions, um, we want to open this space up to questions um, and recognizing that perhaps we're not actually going to be the best people to answer those. Um, so that, and as, as a closing activity or as you decide to leave, um, drop something in the chat that you learned or heard that you can incorporate into your protest or caregiving practice. Um, so, at, at this point, 
Does anyone have questions? Feel free to unmute yourself or just type it into the chat. Um, and we will finish up within the next eight minutes or so. And we got some love for the acronyms, salute and pearly. <laughs> oh, yes, that's a really important study. Planned Parenthood is trying to gather information about tear gas and reproductive health. Um, people are finding that they're having very skewed menstrual cycles after being exposed to tear gas. So look that up. There was a link that just went through in the chat. Um, if you know anybody who, is, who has been exposed to tear gas and had some issues, they're really looking to try to document that information. Um, so it's important to think about that. Um, tear gas has been banned for use in war, and yet somehow it is allowed to be used by police on people in this country. Um, so yeah, that's a really important thing. Um, thanks for sharing that in the chat. Yeah. yeah, really excited to see some of you who I know from various 350 actions and events over the years. Uh, hello, everyone that I know. <laughs> <laughs> and hello, everyone I don't know, too. You're awesome. So. Yeah, thank you all for choosing to attend another Zoom meeting or Zoom presentation. That can, that can be kind of taxing. So we appreciate your presence and your continued presence in movement spaces too. <laughs>